in the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6 is where we are, and we want to invite you to be there with us. And so hopefully you brought a Bible, you're making your way there. There are Bibles around you just in case you need one. Every other chair has one there, and we would just hope you would grab one so that tonight God would speak to you in your life, and he would do so by his word. And I just I think about how rich that is, where the Bible just tells us that his word is able, just to pierce all the way down between the thoughts and the intents of the heart, that God is able to do something in the depths of who you are by his word that honestly nothing else can do. But I believe that's what he wants to do this evening. And so would you join me? Let's ask him for that. Let's ask that he would take his word and make it just meet us in the very depths of who we are and just longing that he would make it real to our lives. Let's ask him for that right now. Father, we thank you this evening that you know us. We thank you that we have before you your word and you tell us in your word is everything necessary for life and godliness that in a relationship in Christ and walking with you, you've given us your word that is a light to our path, that in the midst of a dark world can so often just, we just need your truth. And I just thank you that it is exactly what you say it is. And I thank you that you can and that you do. Take your word as that sharp two-edged sword and you pierce it all the way into the depths of who we are. Lord, nobody else can do that. Nobody else can do it right. Nobody else can can just touch our lives exactly where they need to be just met, and yet you do that. And I'm so grateful for that, and I'm just asking for it this evening, that you would cause our hearts to be open, our ears to be attentive. Just right now, anything that would be a hindrance or a weight, that you just help us to lay it down, that you cleanse and you'd meet us in such a way that we just hear your voice. The voice of your spirit, the voice of, of, of your just faithful speaking into our lives right now. Make that just real for each one of us. We pray for it as we seek your name, and seek your face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're going to have everything that God has for your life, if you're going to be able to do and walk in the things that God has for you, one of the great keys that you, ha- you have to have is learning how to overcome those things that would get in the way. How that you would be able to look on, in one sense, hurdle, if you will, over to get around to go through so that things that would hinder you from having everything that God has for you wouldn't stop you. Would You'd be able to press on past that. That's definitely where we are right now in the book of Nehemiah, is that's being laid out for us. Nehemiah is an incredible book with some amazing historical significance. We've talked about that so far in our study, so I'm not going to redo all of that. If you missed any of that, you can go back and get other studies, but I do want you to think about it this way. We've kind of titled this or have taken really Nehemiah's words that we're going to read tonight from this part of chapter 6 where he says, I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a good work, if you want to think about it even that way, because the word that's used there has that good, that great, it's a right thing. And Nehemiah says, that's what I'm seeking to do. And I want to tell you in that, that that's exactly what God has for you. And in the book of Nehemiah, you have such an incredible picture of how to do that, of how you and I can pursue walking in what God has for our lives. And so let me just catch you up to where we are, if it helps to kind of think about it this way. And in my mind, it honestly does. Nehemiah is an amazing book, and in my, in my head, it's just... I can see each chapter and I, and, I, and I get the major themes and they consistently work in my life. And I'm hoping that it will be that way for you as well. That both this evening and in time to come, you'll be able to think, okay, there's, there's this incredible just picture of how that works. How does it work? Well, in one sense, doing a great work, doing a good work, it really begins as it told us in chapter one by discovering that. We watch Nehemiah discover what it is that God had for his life, how God would move him to be both attuned to and aware of and pursuing what God has, and God has that for your life as well. Chapter one's an amazing book that helps us understand what that looks like, and again, if that's where you are, that's a chapter for you. Then in chapter two, it begins to help us not only understand we need to know what God's work is, but we gotta walk it out. 
We've got to step into what that is and, and, and walking in it both to just in pursuing what God has and walking even within leadership, which is kind of the last half of chapter two and how God uses leadership within the body of Christ to lead us into everything he has. There's just a, a way of saying, okay, knowing what you need to do and then walking in it, that's really key. So you begin to walk it out in prayer. You begin to walk it out in just God's just providence in amazing ways. Chapter two becomes an amazing place that helps you to see that. Then in chapter three, you really get a picture that is a reminder that this is a team thing, that the body of Christ isn't made up of superstars, it's not made up of of us just doing our own thing, but there really is a group effort, and there's this amazing picture of how just that Nehemiah comes and inspires the people of Israel to build the walls, and there's this amazing visual picture of just family by family, person by person, working side by side, each on their own section, but building the things that were before them. And it really is an amazing picture of even what God is seeking to do in our lives. And Jesus is doing as our leader who brings us in to be the body of Christ, which is just an amazing thing. So those three chapters really begin kind of to lock us into, okay, knowing what God has for you, walking in it, being a part of the body of Christ, hey, that's essential. But then the next three chapters really help us kind of come face to face with what I began you with a moment ago if you're going to do it. If you're going to walk in what God has for your life, then you have to learn to overcome. You have to learn not to be knocked down. When things push, you can push back and push through. That we are those who are called overcomers. That, that that's who we are. That we are those who are to be that. Chapter four really showed us that we overcome adversities and adversaries that come from the outside and just some incredible lessons about both just the, the, the world but even more than that, Satan that would press into us. If you're here that evening, we kind of talked about that in one sense. You could almost lock that down in just two simple thoughts. Pray and stay. I mean, just keep praying and stay. Don't let anything keep you from what God has. Now, that's a hard thing, but you gotta be able to press through that. But then add to it, you gotta also press through that sometimes God's people, they're actually part of the problem. That's chapter five. That in one sense, it's not just the enemy from without, sometimes it's the enemy from within. Sometimes it's God's people not behaving in a loving way. Sometimes it's God's people that they would almost hinder the work and that's just part of the deal and you gotta learn to overcome that, overcoming what I called friendly fire. And really we talked about that much of that last week. But now we come to the third, and, and really just as you think about these three things, uh, just this place over overcoming, and then next week we'll get to the, we're only gonna cover half of chapter six tonight, and next week we'll come to the, just the building of the wall and the completion, some amazing things there. But in chapter six, we get this picture that leaders need to be overcomers or overcoming leaders, and just gonna lay that out before us, just gonna lay out the reality of that. So again, pause, and if your mind is wandering, I'm hoping that just in Nehemiah would would speak to you because I'm gonna tell you that you you need all three of these. (laughs) I mean, we need all of this. We gotta overcome the enemy from without. We gotta overcome the enemy within at times. And then there is this attack that comes very specifically so often against leadership that in many ways that you gotta see that, that in many ways that's kind of Satan's target in the way that he works. In fact, think about it this way if it helps. Try to picture it as maybe some battlefield can be, however that works in your mind, some World War II or even Civil War battlefield if you wanna think about it that way and you have these two opposing enemies, it's as if the enemy's looking and he's recognizing that the, the troops are coming together, the battle's beginning to close and the enemy's pretty smart. He knows this, take out the leaders. Take out the ones in charge, take out the ones who are directing, take out the ones who are, who are you know, kind of you know, leading the, the forces ahead and you can gain victory. It's a very just practical enemy, you know, just attack that takes place on any battlefield. That in one sense, okay, you know, if you wanna push back, if you wanna begin to bring down the, the, the things that God has, then there is a sense that the leaders themselves will become targets. Now, that becomes a reality that you just need to understand. That leaders have that, you know, that there is a sense that part of being, stepping into serving God, part of just wanting to, to, to do that automatically paints a target on your back. I think about it, we've, you know, when we started the church, gosh, 21 years ago, there's one of the guys that started probably early in the church, and he still comes just consistently, and he often prays, and, but it's funny, because his prayer almost every week, and he tells me, it's like the same prayer. He just prays for us all the time. He says, Lord, you know, I know the enemy's got a target 
on, on Pastor Jim's back and t- Pastor Phil's back, and he just prays for us to overcome. He just prays for us to get that, and in my mind, it just works. I mean, I mean, for some of you, you get it, right? You might even think about it this way, because it's probably the most popular Far Side cartoon, at least I think it was, that, you know, you kind of have that kind of idea of, you know, bummer of a birthmark, you know? It's like, you know, it's just like in one sense, you look at that and think, you know, that's kind of where it is for a leader, it's like you look at it and say, well, that's a bummer. You know, boy, you just, you, just, you, just got, you just got target painted on you to step into leadership. But that's exactly the reality that we need to understand. It's kind of what we want to talk about this evening, and I want to bring it to you even from Jesus' words. Jesus said it this way when he was talking to the disciples. He said, you know, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, talking to his disciples the night before he goes to the cross. And he says, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He says, this is what, this what's gonna happen. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be struck, and when that happens, you guys are gonna run. You guys are gonna run. Now, that it literally did happen. And yet, so often, it's exactly still the, the target of the enemy, and what he seeks to do to, to target both Christ, obviously, in our lives, but even to take leaders and, and to cause people to scatter, and so that's really the, the issue that I want to bring before you this evening, and just want you to see it with me, that, that targeted attack that Nehemiah is now going to speak personally. So if you got it again in your mind, chapter four was the enemy pressing against the whole. Chapter five was the attacks from men, and now it's that very targeted attack on leaders, Well, before we dive into seeing the attacks, let me just pause and just make sure that we're on the same page or maybe even ask a question that you should be asking. As we think about this and we think about how that works and we think about, you know, kind of overcoming these targeted attacks, you know, how do we face that? I mean, how is it that as you come into this evening, what should you be hearing tonight? What is it that God, in one sense, would have for you in the first half of Nehemiah chapter 6? Well, he probably has so much more than I have any understanding of, but I do want to tell you a few things that I think are certainly there. For starters, again, there is a sense that we just need to recognize these attacks, and very specifically to recognize that attack for anybody that steps into any kind of leadership in the body of Christ. There's something about just understanding the tactic of the enemy, to understand that just by the nature of who you are, that you have now stepped into a role that makes you a larger target that the enemy knows that to hurt the body of Christ, they can hurt more people by hurting you. I mean, just, a, and, and so there's something about recognizing that, hopefully not a surprise, hopefully not like, well, I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know that's what I was signing up for. I didn't know that that's what this whole thing looked like. Yeah, you, you, well, you should. I mean, God is so honest, and I love Jesus, because he tells us over and over, hey, this is exactly how it's gonna work. This is exactly how it's gonna work. Now, again, somebody's gonna be sitting here this evening and thinking, well, great, Jim, so you're saying basically I'm off the hook, right? Because I'm not a leader. So, I mean, I, I, I could just kind of tune out the rest of the evening. Well, no, honestly, as we look on this, you are, you do have influence. Every one of our lives has influence, and, and this message, though in one sense has very specific application for those who are leading, Understand this, it's the way that Satan targets any person individually. See, again, if you can think about it kind of in that battlefield analogy, that Civil War or World War II battlefield, it's as if the enemy is looking for targets. And if you begin to make a difference, and you begin to, just within your realm of influence, begin to make a difference, it's just like the enemy goes like, attack there. I mean, that's a, that's a target. That, you've just you know, isolated that. So in one sense, you need to understand what he's going to do. You need to understand how it's going to work and what you need to do with that. Having said that, on top of that, you ought to just pray. I mean, hopefully it will already be that way, but I already told you that in one sense, we have some in our church that pray this very consistently. We would always take more. We would always like, yeah, okay, we get it. You know, we understand how Satan's going to work, so we are going to just, you know, counterattack. We're going to pray for leaders. We're going to pray for those who are under these attacks because we're going to get what Satan's going to be trying to do, and we're going to pray exactly against his tactics. And so it may be that as we move into this evening that God will be just arming you for prayer, arming you in the things that God has for you, and I certainly believe that that is true. So that's where we're going. That's what we want to see this evening as we think about how this works and and, and how the attacks work. And so let's just begin. You have your Bibles open there, hopefully still. Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now it happened. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall. 
Pause again and understand, hey, these are the enemies. These are names that should be familiar. If you're in the book of Nehemiah already, it's like, oh yeah, these are the guys who are enemies to the work of God, and they've heard. They've heard that the wall is being built, that a good work is happening, that God is doing something amazing and, and, and working in their lives. It says they heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together in the village of the plain of Ono. And, and, and they thought to do me harm. We began to watch this, and in one sense, understand this, target number one, or the attack number one, or bombardment, if you want to think about it that way, from the enemy, it really is an attack of distraction. Now, I like it, and again, you're just going to have to just put up with my silly little mind in one sense, because I love the way that this kind of reads it way at, its way out. It's as if, they, here they are, the enemies are watching the work happen, and so they send Nehemiah a message and said, you know what, why don't you come and meet us in a place of, oh no. I mean, that's just how it works in my mind. It's like, just why don't you come to, oh no. I mean, that's just, you, you just got to know, if you get invited, you know, to, oh no, <laughs> don't go. You know, that's just not a place that you want to go to. And yet that's, it's like, why don't you come to a place where you're going to go, oh no, that's a bad place to go. Don't, don't do that. Don't come there. And yet that's exactly what they're trying to do. Now go and continue reading. It says, so I sent messengers to him, verse three, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should I leave? Why should the work cease while I am going, while I leave it and go down to you? Pause again and just catch it. Nehemiah gets it in one sense. He says, here's what they're doing. They're they're, they're, they're sending me these messages. They're inviting me into the plains of, oh no, uh, you know, to come there. And again, it told us at the end of verse two, go back and see it. Sam Ballot and Geshem sent to me saying, come, let us meet together among the villages in the plains of Ono. Oh but they thought to do me harm. So the intention was to do Nehemiah harm. Now, question, what does that mean? I mean, what exactly were they intending? Were they going to kidnap Nehemiah? Were they going to kill him? You know, we don't actually know. I mean, in one sense, Nehemiah just says they wanted to do me harm, and it could literally be physical harm. It might be something there, but there's probably something even more important for you to get, because see, the word harm there, it's an interesting word. It literally is the word for bad or evil, so you can kind of take it that they, they thought to do me bad, they thought to work bad. And if you're catching it, the contrast is between that which is bad and that which is good. Because that's what Nehemiah is going to say. He says, you know, I, you know, I'm doing a good work. I'm doing a great work. He says, but they, want, but they wanted to do bad. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of a simple thing, if you can catch it. Nehemiah wants to do what's good, and they want him to do what's bad. Well, what would that be? Well, it could be a whole list of things, but the simple intention is simply what Nehemiah realizes. He says, I'm doing a great work there in verse three, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Well, I go down to you. That really was what the aim was. The aim of the enemy is that this moment, just to cause the work to stop, by what? Well, again, I already told you, it's a bombardment of distraction. I mean, in one sense, the enemy is just inviting him, hey, why don't you come over here, you know? Why don't you, why don't you stop doing what you're doing, you know, because, you know, we don't really like what you're doing, so why don't you come over this direction and just to do that, to step over there, Nehemiah recognizes what it would be, it would be distraction. I think about that, and my mind just immediately goes into the Gospel of Luke when, when Jesus is talking about Mary and Martha, and it tells us Martha was distracted. And again, that's just worth just noting. She's distracted. She's distracted actually with much serving. It wasn't necessarily bad things. See, distractions, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be doing something that's all by itself, evil or harmful. They just gotta keep you from doing what you're meant to do. She says that she was distracted with much serving and she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And it's this crazy scene when Jesus is there and Mary and Martha are there and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus just soaking up his word and Martha's like, you know what? That's a waste of time. 
Tell her to get up. <laughs> we have stuff to do. There, there, there's rugs to be beaten out. There's food to be made. There's beds to be, I mean, there's just so much that needs to be done. And I can't believe that you would be, you know, investing your life, investing your time in that. And then it just simply tells us, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. He says, Martha, you are so troubled. You are so distracted with so many things, but Mary's actually chosen the right thing, and there's no way. I mean, Jesus comes to her defense, and he does that in your life and mine as well, just inviting us to that, but again, the aim is that we need to follow that that we need to be those who would do like Mary and say, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna go there. So how do we do this? Okay, if the enemy's attack is distraction, and I just wanna tell you, it is his first attack. It is his first way to do it, just in one sense, to try to distract us from what God has for our lives. How do we overcome it? Well, you see what Nehemiah does. We read it, but again, he just answers. Verse three, so I sent messages to them. I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down? And there's probably just that cool emphasis because it is a downward move. Why should I go down to you? One of the great things that we just need to do is they're just gonna say, no, I'm not gonna do that because you know, I'm not gonna cease. I will not cease what God has for me or even to say it differently, what God would have for your life is to be someone who knows what God has for you And don't let anything keep you from it. Don't let anything keep you from it. Now again, maybe you're saying, well, Jim, I'm not sure what God has for my life. Well, that's chapter one. Go back and get that message and try to figure it out. Say, okay, God, who am I? What is it you have for my life? How does that work? And and, and what is it you're trying to do in, in, in the midst of my life? And once you get that answer, here's what I just want to invite you to. Don't let anything keep you from it. Because one of Satan's greatest tactics is simply to distract you, to cause it to be where you stop doing what you're called to do, what God has for you, and he'll even seek to get you invested into other things that aren't necessarily bad things. It's not the best thing. They're not what God has intended for your life. They're not doing what it is, and I want to just simply tell you one of the great things in your life and mine is to know what that is, and once you get it, don't let anything turn you from it. Charles Spurgeon once said it this way. He says, if God calls you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. And in one sense, he says, if whatever you're called to do, anything less than that, it would be a downward move, which is what Nehemiah has been invited to. Anything less than that. In fact, there's an interesting story I was reading of a missionary who was doing an incredible work in China. And he was just a skilled linguist and a very good organizer. And I mean, he's just doing an amazing thing. And there was an American company that was moving into that area. And they, you know, kind of ran into this guy and realized what a great, you know, just grasp he had of both the culture and the language and organization. And so they invited him, you know, to come and work for them. And they offered him a lavish salary. And he turned him down. Well, the guy couldn't believe it, who was the owner, and he thought, well, you know, it just probably wasn't enough. And so he ended up doubling his offer, which was more than anybody else in his entire company, other than himself, just saying, you know, we would pay you all of this, you know, if you would leave what you're doing and come do this. And the missionary just wrote back and says, you, you don't mis- you misunderstand me. It's not that the offer was too small, the job was too small. You know, it's not that you were offering me, not, you weren't offering me, you know, what you're asking me to do, it's less than the best I could do with my life. And I want to tell you right now, that's where you have to be. The kind of thing, it's like, you know what, you know, that, that there are so many things that would keep me from what God wanted for my life, and the enemy is good about this. He's good at his tactics, and, and, and I'll sadly tell you that, that sometimes this actually works in leaders' life. I mean, they're kind of beginning to make a difference in the body of Christ, and then, you know, they get, hey, why don't you come over to, oh, no bad idea, but come over to oh no, and, and as soon as they do it, they quit doing what they're supposed to do. They quit doing what they're supposed to do, and it's a tactic the enemy has, and I want to tell you, for you, you got to be in a place where it's like, you know, if I figure out what God's going to do, wants me to do, nothing would drag me from that. You know, if you're called to be a Sunday school teacher, if you're called to be a prayer warrior, if you're called to do something, you'd be like, you know what, there, anything less than that, no matter what it is, it's not, everything else is gonna become, 
you know, just the building blocks around that because I know what I am, I know what I'm supposed to do, and I'm passionate about doing it. That's what Nehemiah shows us, and I want to tell you it's absolutely necessary to have this unjust, you know, just that you were saying, I'm not going to be turned aside. You know, I think about God speaking to Joshua where he simply told him, you know, Joshua, don't turn to the right hand or to the left you know, just stay on target. You know, stay on what I'm calling you to do. And, and there's such a great need in that in our lives. Again, if maybe that's even for you this evening. If that's even right, happening right now, that the enemy is trying to distract you away from what God has. I just want to call you to be like Nehemiah. I said, nope, not going to do it. You know, just, I'm going to do what God has for me. I'm, that's what I'm passionately going to pursue. And nothing's going to keep me from doing what God has called in my life. Well, Nehemiah passes that. But understand this, the enemy doesn't give up. I added one more little sentence there. The bombardment of distraction, this t- place of unknown, uh, he just keeps trying. Because see, we read it, and then you pick it up there in verse four. It says, but they sent me this message four times. It's like it didn't, even, if it didn't work the first time. We'll just keep trying. We, if the first distraction didn't work, we'll send another. And if that distraction doesn't work, we'll send another. We'll just keep sending distractions to try to move you from that. But Nehemiah had to keep answering him in the same manner. So needed just to be undistractable from what God has for us. Well, that doesn't work, and so the first bombardment just doesn't work, and so now the enemy tries another tactic. Verse 5, then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time. This was with an open letter in his hand, and it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Gershom says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, and that you might be their king. And you have appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now these matters are going to be reported to the king, so come. Therefore, let us consult together. Come to the plains of Ono. I mean, now we're going to really press in there. And, and, and so now we come to this next distraction. It really is a bombardment of weakness. Now, I, I, I'll make more sense of that because that's what Nehemiah is going to call it. In fact, why don't you just scan down there so you see it. Verse 9. It says, for they all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work. Their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Nehemiah gets this, okay, here's what's trying to happen. He's trying to make us weak and the assault, the attack really comes as, as a slander. They begin to just have false reports and rumors and, 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 and really pressing into that, which really is quite honestly an attack on reputation. It really is an attack on reputation and what its intention is to produce fear. And again, Nehemiah diagnoses it for us because that's what he says in verse nine. For they were all trying to make us afraid. They're trying to make them afraid. They're trying to move into that. And I just want you to know there's such, such a state when you can get somebody into a place where through slander and through fear and through just you know, lies and kind of moving them, you can so often manipulate them into doing things they would never have done otherwise. Adolf Hitler in one of his early talks, explained it this way. He simply said, mental confusion, contradiction of feeling, indecisiveness, panic. He said, these are our weapons. This is what we'll do. We're gonna make people panic. We're gonna make them indecisive. We're 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 just gonna keep them confused and and make them afraid. And as soon as we get them there, then we can begin to to, to move in in, in so many ways. And that's exactly what the enemy is seeking to do. It's what they're trying to do. And in one sense, what it really boils down to is trying to make us concerned and live by that fear of what people think about us. Now, this is a bigger deal than maybe you would even want to admit, maybe to the person around you, but let's just be honest. It's it's a struggle. It's a struggle probably in most lives here that in one sense, one of the things that so often presses is really, I just kind of worried what people think about me. You know, I'm worried what they'll say about me. I'm worried about slander. I'm worried about accusation. I'm worried about how that would work. I'm worried about how that would come to cross. And yet the intention of the enemy isn't, isn't even the slander. His intention is simply to cause it so that your hands become limp and just weak. It's like I don't, so that you just find yourself standing in front of what God has for your life. And it's like, I just, I can't. I don't have strength to do it. I don't have any ability to move forward, and yet the intention of that, the aim of that, again, is that place of attacking our character, attacking those things that we were, that God has for us, but the aim will ultimately come to where the work itself would just stop. That's what he's aiming for. 
I think about it, Jesus spoke of it or speaks about it in John 12 to those who are following Jesus and it says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. It says that Jesus was there and he was presenting himself. He says there, even among the leaders, there were people that actually believed in him, but don't, don't misunderstand this. This isn't saying believing like they're saved. In fact, Jesus is really clear about this in the gospel because it goes on to say, Jesus says, if you confess me before men, you know, then, then, then you're mine. But if you won't, you, you don't. So Jesus makes it clear that these are not believers. But the thing is, they actually, it's, their, their, their resistance to Christ isn't because they didn't believe him. They do, but they're afraid. They're afraid of what the Pharisees would do to them. They're afraid of what that happens. And so it simply says, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They were more concerned about what people would say about them than what God would say about them. And therein lies one of the great traps in our lives. Paul the Apostle would write about it in his own life. He says, for am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I seeking to try to please men? He says, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. He says, you know, he says, when I'm looking at this, he says, if, who, who am I trying to uh, just find their approval? He says, if I was still trying to please people, if, if that was my motivation in life, I wouldn't be able to do what God had for me. I wouldn't be able to walk in that. I wouldn't be able to, to, to have all of that just working out of my life. Now, by the way, that's the ESV translation. I liked it because the New King James says, you know, do I now persuade men? And I think in one sense, we don't always get that. You know, it's like, okay, persuade, but it really has the idea of seeking approval. I, I think about how that works and just, you know, as he simply says, you know, am I now seeking that approval of man or of God? You know, and, and just inviting us to be those who say, okay, here's the deal. You know, I, I, I need to live for that. And so that's really what we begin to see when watch Nehemiah overcome. And so he just responds. He responds with, I'm gonna say, he just counters it and he prays. Notice what he does. Verse eight, it says, so I send to him saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they were trying to make us afraid saying, their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So he's watching through this whole thing and he just begins by denying it, saying, hey, you know what, you, just, you made this up in your own mind. But it's also worth noting he didn't go through and, and just detail by detail just counter everything that the enemy claimed. I mean, just want to tell you there's something powerful about that. You know, if you spend your time just, you know, trying to undo everything that people think about you, you'll spend your whole time doing it. In the back of my mind, it just works in one of those crazy old quotes that just simply said, you know, never wrestle with a pig, you know, because you both get dirty and the pig likes it, you know. <laughs> And there is a sense of just when, when someone's insulting you, when someone's, you know, kind of doing that, don't, don't get down on their level. Don't, don't, just, and he says, you guys just made that up. He doesn't go through and just, that's wrong. He just says, you guys made that up. By the way, as a quick aside, it is partly because of this, because of slander, we ought to be those who don't quickly believe it. it tells us in 1 Corinthians that love believes all things. It has the idea that we believe the best. In fact, it tells us in Timothy, it says, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. It says, when you, when you have someone who's leadership, when you have someone who's in that role, you know, don't, don't believe it unless there's really good valid evidence for it. In fact, again, that's how it writes it in the New King James. I like the NASB. It simply says it this way. It says, do not entertain an accusation against an elder. I just like that because don't even let it kind of just, you know what, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna be slow to believe it. Now, it doesn't mean that I never believe it, but I'm just, I'm just asking you. Hey, our enemy does this. He attacks leaders all the time and we live in a world that you can destroy somebody with just slander without ever proving it. And, and, and the sad reality is in some Christians' lives because of that, we're very quick to believe it. Oh, I, I thought that was probably that way. <laughs> it's like, I, God's just telling you, be the other way because we know what the enemy does. He'll slander people. He is slandering Nehemiah and he's saying, I'm gonna do it publicly. I'm gonna do it in an open letter. I'm gonna police this in the public square. I'm gonna let everybody know that Nehemiah, you are in this for yourself. You're trying to be king. That's what I'm, I'm gonna tell everybody this. It's totally not true. Be slow to believe it. Now, if it's true, goes on to say those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that the others may take the warning. And there is a sense that, you know, it's not that we don't ever believe it when leaders fall, because they do fall, but we're just slow to believe it because we recognize this is part of the attack that the enemy does. So Nehemiah does it, but then he does my favorite part. He does what he does almost all the way through the book of Nehemiah. He prays. 
he says, okay, you know, I get it. I get it, I, I know what the enemy's trying to do, and he figures it out, he says, okay, here's the enemy is trying to make it so that I stand in front of God's work, and my hands become limp, and I just become weak, and I don't do it. I mean, that's what he says. He says, their hands will be weak in verse nine in the work, and it will not be done, and so Nehemiah turns and he prays, he says, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. If the enemy's trying to make me weak, Lord, would you make me strong? You know, in one sense, it almost undoes the enemy's tactic because he reckoned, hey, the enemy's trying to make my arms weak. God, would you make me strong? Would you make it so that, that, that the very tactic that the enemy's trying to work into my life, the exact opposite happens by your strength? If I'm in my mind thinking of David in 1 Samuel, it says David was greatly distressed and the people were talking about stoning him. It was a rough place in his life and again, kind of accusations probably flowing and the people are grieved, but then it just simply says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's kind of what this is. This place was like, okay, God, make me strong. I mean, God, I need to be strong right now. I, I, I see it. I know what the enemy's trying to do right now and, and if you're doing something that God has for you, if you're walking in what God has for you, you'll know what this feels like. You know what it feels like when somebody says something really crazy about you, some bad report happens, and some accusation, and, and you find yourself just sitting there thinking, oh, I just feel, I feel weak. You can do a couple things at that moment. You could bow to what Satan's trying to do and weaken your hands and not do it, or you could say, God, I get it. Strengthen my hands. <laughs> Make me strong. I mean, cause the enemy to be pushed back at this moment so that his very tactic that would seek to take me down would actually become the means of making me stronger. I think it's a great thing. That's what Nehemiah does, and I absolutely love it. So as you're thinking this through, you're thinking about how this whole thing works, we have a couple of thoughts. We have distraction. We have weakness. Now it brings us to the third bombardment, and it's actually probably, I, I can't say this for certain, but I'm just gonna make a guess it's probably what you were thinking of first. When I told you at the very beginning that Satan makes a target out of leaders, you were probably thinking that in one sense it would be a bombardment to, to lead them to sin. That's what this third attack is, where really the enemy is gonna seek to try to cause Nehemiah to sin and, and to bring about harm in that. But I, I wanna preface that before we talk about that with this. The enemy does that, and it's, a, it's an ugly tactic, Sadly, sometimes it works. But I also think it's not his first move. I think it, you know, if he can get people by distraction and he can get them by weakness, he'll do that first. If he can distract you from what God has for your life, if he can just make you weak, it's, it, in his estimation, it's a far better tack. Because in one sense, if you lead somebody into sin, it has a couple of things. It can become very destructive, but oftentimes it has a good turnaround. I mean, somehow when you recognize, God, I've sinned, I need to turn around and I'm doing the wrong thing, it becomes more corrective often in people's life than distraction and weakness is. That sometimes you could spend years, decades, being distracted and being weak before ever really recognizing how, what, what a tactic the enemy has used in your life. And so I just wanna call you to see that and recognize that because in some ways it does almost move like, okay, we'll try number one. Okay, if number one doesn't work, then we'll move to number two. And if number two doesn't work, okay, then we're gonna go all out. We're gonna go for the, the, the ultimate tack, which is ultimately to try to make them sin. Well, that's what's gonna happen. So why don't you notice it with me? It tells us there in verse 10, it says, afterwards I came into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, Deliah the son of Methabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night, they, they will come to kill you. Now, there's a lot of details in this. I'm not gonna have time to entirely unpack for you, but understand it is sin. I mean, in one sense, the attack in, is to lead him into this. In fact, Nehemiah is gonna diagnose it just in a moment, so go on down with me tells us in verse 13, he says, for this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report and that it might reproach me. So he's gonna recognize, okay, the attack is to make him sin. And then once he sins, to, to, to you know, make it a reproach and turn the people away from what God has for him. That's really the attack, but it's quite, it's quite crafty. See, so you, you get it, we read it. It told us there in verse 10 that this guy is a secret informer. But Nehemiah lets us know that, that he didn't know that. 
You know, he tells us, you know, that, that, he, that he didn't know that, that this guy was, was actually a secret informer. He, he works craftily. He pretends to be Nehemiah's friend. He tells us, you know, that he, that he comes in there to this guy's house. He comes in there, and there's this secret informer, and he tells him, you know, let us go together, in verse 10, into the house of God. And, and without, again, going into great details, that it's talking about the tabernacle, the temple at that point, and the temple that had been rebuilt, and to go into the holy place or the holy of holies and the holy place, that was only for the priests. And ultimately, just to go there, to go into that would have been sin for him. And again, there's a lot of details in that, but you just gotta understand if he had done that, yeah, it would have been a very safe place, I suppose, that nobody else would come. But it would have been sin for him. And he recognizes that this guy comes as a friend, pretending to be his friend to lead him into this. In fact, he even says that God had given it to him. I mean, that's what he tells us again. He goes in there in verse 10. He says, Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. He says he didn't get it at first. He thought that, you know, this guy came to him as his friend and said, you know, God has told me. God's told me you, you need to run. You need to go into the temple because this is a dangerous place and you just need to take care of you right now, Nehemiah. And, 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 he, and, he, and he's hearing this, and so often Satan's tactic comes this way. Often it is a Judas who leads it, you know, tries to lead into st- to sin and to lead into destruction. God, you know, Satan uses him in our lives. And the scary thing is that sometimes he can even use God talk. Oh, this is what God wants for you. I mean, God loves you. I mean, he want, I mean you, God made you that way. You know, you should just try to be who you are, you know, I mean, because that's really what God would want. I mean, somehow using his language, using, you know, talks about God, but all of it seeking to lead Nehemiah at this moment to act selfishly, to, to, to make him afraid, and then to care only about himself so that he would act irrationally. That in that moment, he would just, oh yeah, the enemy's coming, I gotta go, and, 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 and that, that's what the enemy's trying to do, and Nehemiah recognizes it. He says, you know, for this reason, he's hired, verse 13, that I should be afraid and act. He's just longing that out of fear, I'll make a decision. And that decision would have been his destruction. By the way, just as a quick aside again, this tactic of leading to sin and then reproach, it's so often what the enemy does. He tempts you to sin, and then the moment you sin, he turns it around and beats you up with it. Oh, look at, you know, you know go ahead and sin, go ahead and sin. Yeah, you should do it because, you know, you, you ought to have what you want. And the moment you do it, oh, you're terrible. You're the worst thing ever. I mean, look at him. This, this guy calls himself a Christian, and, and it, that's just the way he works. That's the tack of the enemy. So how does Nehemiah overcome? Well, he does a few things that I just want you to understand. I mean, he thinks, he resists, he pries. He thinks. I just want you to understand that as he, as he does this whole thing, he thinks honestly. I mean, Nehemiah is beginning to process this through and, 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 he, and he just asks in verse 11, he says, should I do that? Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would flee, who would go into the temple to save his life? I mean, he just, is, is, he's, just, he's just thinking it through logic. He's like, wait, should, should I do that? I mean, I'm not a priest. What in the world would I be doing going in there? And if I did that, it would only be destruction. I mean, you know, who am I to, to do that? And, and if I'd flee, you know, who would, you know, it says, if, if I just did that, it would be altogether, it'd be wrong. I, I, I wish I had a lot of time to develop this. I don't. But I just want you to make sure you get it. Sin. It's entirely irrational. If it were only a matter of ration, who would sin? It's like, okay, let's see, I'm gonna sin, I'm gonna do what's wrong that's gonna hurt me, bring destruction, hurt my family, hurt my witness. I mean, yeah, that's, and it's gonna rob me of the very best for my life. I mean, who would ever do it? I mean, sin by its very nature doesn't make sense. But the thing that gets you to do it is not thinking clearly. I mean, not thinking, so should I, I mean, is that what I'm made for? Am I, is that what I, that would be a wrong thing. I mean, if you could just think logically, I mean, if you just open up your mind and say, okay, that's not what I'm gonna do, and, and then Nehemiah just responds. He says, no. He, says, he thinks it through, and he says, I will not go in. No, he just, I'm not gonna do that. That would be the wrong thing for me to do. It's worth me just saying this. You can say no. You need to say no. You, 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 there will never, never be a place where 
you have to sin. Where you'll be like, I, I just couldn't do anything about it. It will never happen. I think about what it tells us in Corinthians, that no temptation is overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful. He will never let you allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it. You will never, ever be in a temptation where you can honestly say, I just didn't have a choice. I just had to. You know, there's, there's, now, that's what the world will want to tell you. And, and sometimes it's what you tell yourself. Well, I just, you know, that's just who I am. I just got to do it. It's got to, got to just, you know, I don't have any choice in the matter. Christian, you have choice. God will never let it happen in your life, and you can say no. You should say no, because it will only be about to bring about harm. And so Nehemiah recognizes, he thinks this is wrong. I shouldn't do this. He says no, and then he just prays. I mean, I love it because Nehemiah does this consistently. Whenever anything presses him, he goes before God. And so he just recognizes this. He says, I'm not gonna do it. He perceives that the enemy's in this. And it says in verse 13, for this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act this way and sin so that they might have a cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God turns to God in prayer. Remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to their works and the prophetess Nobiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. In other words, we get a little bit of a picture. This was more than just a one man. I mean, they, they really had rallied against Nehemiah. He says, God, just re- remember them. God, do, would, you, would you just take care of this? I can tell you there's something about turning it over to God and turning to God that finds your strength. I think about what it tells us in James. It says, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. It says when you, when you kind of get there and the enemy's pressing, turn to God. Like, God, I'm just gonna submit this into your life. Would you take care of this, God? Would you remember the enemy? Would you be my defense? And, and he says when you do that, when you turn to God in the midst of it, the enemy runs away. And the enemy flees in that sense when you turn to God and finding his strength. So I tell you, that's exactly what Nehemiah does, and he does it a great job in so doing. He just says, I, I, he recognizes this, and he says, okay, that is, that's wrong. I am not going to do this. And Nehemiah overcomes. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing help. I don't know where that finds you this evening, and again, I, I think about it. We have this, these three attacks, this, di- this distraction and weakness and sin. I just want to tell you what Satan is seeking to do, and he does it against leaders and all the people, but there's probably one other quick lesson that we need to just tie up before we pull it to a close this evening. See, I, I'd asked you at the beginning of this, okay, what do you do with this? And, and part of this evening is just to recognize, oh yeah, that's what the enemy does, I get it. He tries to distract us, he tries to make us weak, or he'll try to get us to sin. That, yeah, I get it, I get it. I, I mean, I get that. You ought to know it in your life, you ought to know it in other people's lives, and you ought to pray. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. I'm gonna pray that people would not be distracted from what God has for them. I'm gonna pray that God would strengthen their hands and I'm gonna pray that they'll overcome sin. That's what I'm gonna do because I I get it. That's what our enemy does. But there is kind of a third response and the response is simply this. Learn to return. Well, what do I mean? Well, sadly, the enemy does work sometimes. Sometimes leaders get distracted. Sometimes they become weak. Sometimes they sin. And the aim of that is exactly what Jesus said. He said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. You, you take, out, take out a leader and the, the sheep scatter. Jesus shares this with the disciples. He's telling them about it. He says, you know, here's what's gonna happen. All of you are gonna stumble because of me this night. He says, for it is written, I'm gonna strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. In response to it, you probably know Peter speaks up and he answers him, Lord, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never do it. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, I can, it's just one of these fun scenes where people are like, yeah, I, I, these other guys, I get it. You know, I was kind of looking at John the other day and I was thinking, you know, I, I could see John falling, you know, stumbling, but Lord, you're not me. I mean, not me, I'm, I'm really good. You know, nothing's gonna make me stumble. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you to the end of the days, Jesus. I'll give my life up for you before I stumble. And then Jesus just tells him, says, Peter, says, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you like wheat. I mean, it's one of those crazy cool stories that I just, I get kind of almost just, it's like, Jesus, like, really? Satan wants you. And he's been asking for you to sift you like wheat. Now, it's a crazy little illustration I don't have time to go into, but in the back of my mind, I just like to insert myself into the story. And it's like, if I were Peter, I'd be like, and you told him no, right? (laughs) 
I mean, Satan asked and you said no. I mean, that's kind of, that's what you're about to tell me, right? And, and, and that's not what he's going to say. Instead, he simply says, but I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He says, I've been praying for you. I'm praying that you won't fall. You are going to, you are going to stumble. You are going to scatter. But when you get back up, come back and then use that to strengthen And I just want to tell you, there's part of this to understand because this is a tactic of the enemy, that part of this whole lesson is to both learn what the enemy does and then to recognize, hey, that's what happens. I mean, sometimes those things happen and and scatters, and and yet we need to be those that get back up. And, And I just say this very, very carefully, but very, very personally. I think there might be somebody here this evening, and honestly, you're scattered. I mean, you, the, 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 a shepherd was struck, a leader was struck, the enemy had his way, maybe he got distracted, maybe he's just quit doing or she quit doing what she was supposed to do, or maybe, maybe they you know, just became weak and just failed to be who they were supposed to be. Maybe they actually even fell into sin, and, and it worked. You were like, okay, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna back up. I know, I don't, you know, this, and, and, and you pulled back, you scattered for a moment. But I just want to tell you, Jesus is prying. And I tell you, part of learning this in the Christian life is like, I'm going to get back up. <laughs> you know, I, 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 that, that's the enemy. Why would I ever give in to his tactics? I mean, the, you know, there, there's that simple understanding. Satan wins battles, but he's going to lose the war. And, and, and the, so we want to keep pressing through. We want to keep pressing through. And I just want to say, if that's where you are this evening, if, if you just need to kind of say, okay, I get what the enemy's doing, but I'm also going to learn to return, because I get that, then, then I just want to invite you to do that. So that's kind of where we are this evening. You can take your Bibles and close them. Again, I hope that in one sense that maybe God has met you. It's kind of a crazy story, and, and maybe, again, you're in leadership, and this has been exactly where you are. Or maybe Satan has just made you a special target. Maybe he's realized that you're trying to make a difference in your family, Maybe you're trying to make a difference in, in your world, and so he's trying to distract you. He's trying to weaken your hands. He's trying to make you sin, and I'm just inviting you to see it and think, no way. I, I'm not gonna, I, I wanna be a Nehemiah. I wanna be one of like, I am not gonna pull away from what God has for my life. No, you know, no. I mean, that's kind of just like, no, and just keep praying. No, and you know, that kind of pray and stay. Just, I'm gonna I'm I'm stick with what God has, and I'm gonna tell him no, and I'm gonna keep turning to God. I wanna invite you to that, because there is a definite need that this evening that God would strengthen us for that. So would you join me right now? Let's ask him to strengthen us. God, we recognize what you told us, that this is a war. I think about what you spoke to Timothy that told him to fight that good fight, Lord, you've told us that we have an enemy who seeks our harm. And Lord, I thank you for this account of Nehemiah, and and I love it in a lot of reasons. I love the clarity that comes through it. But I love that Nehemiah stayed. I love that it didn't work. I love that the enemy tried to distract him, and he wouldn't be distracted. I love that the enemy tried to weaken his hands, and he wouldn't be weakened. I love that the enemy tried to make him sin and he wouldn't sin. I love that he resisted and kept pressing and kept serving. And I love what's coming, and we'll talk about next week, that the work was done, that Nehemiah accomplished amazing things for you. God, I'm just praying. Wherever that's found us this evening, if we're distracted, if the enemy has taken us into the plains of oh no, if, if we've been drawn into some, just being distracted from what you have for our lives, would you cause us to get back on tack and just recognize I am not turning away from what God you have for my life. But if our hands have become weakened, if we've allowed just the fear of man and, and the fear of what people think about us to consume us in such a way that keeps us from moving forward in what you have for us, God, would you strengthen our hands? Would you strengthen our hands this evening and all that you have for us? and where the enemy is targeting us to sin, where he's orchestrating just things that would seek to bring just reproach upon your name and your people, Lord, would you cause us to overcome? Lord, I thank you that you're doing that and so much more. God, in the midst of all of that, I thank you, Jesus, that you're praying for us, even as you told Peter. And I pray that wherever we are, if we've stumbled, that we get back up and we press back into the battle. And and Lord, just knowing that, that that's what you have for us. 
God, we ask for that this evening and just ask that you'd make it real and that you would find victory and you'd work that in our lives as we seek your face, asking for it even right now as we just humble ourselves before you and ask for all that you have for us. We ask it together in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and stand if you would, guys. All I once held dear Built my life upon All this world reveres And wars to own All I once thought gain I have counted loss Spent and worthless now Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're my rest, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you. desire is to know you more to be found in you and known as yours to possess by faith what I could not earn all surpassing gift of right Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're my rest, you're my joy, my righteousness. Straight a highway, a path 
for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon Like a bride waiting for her groom Make us a church ready for you Every heart longing for a king We sing even so come Lord Jesus because we know you are coming quickly, Lord. But Lord, I just ask that you would help us to keep our focus on you, Lord. That our eyes would stay on you, that our hearts would always be towards you, Lord. That when we're tempted, that we would resist, Lord. And when we're weak, that we'd look to you for strength. Lord, we would know that you've already won the victory, Lord. But we need your help, Lord. And I just pray that you would be there for us always. And I just ask that you be with us this week, Lord, that you keep us safe. And that our eyes would stay focused on you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>